Like nearly everything in life, rap is co-ed. Based around performance poetry since before the expression was coined, women have been among the world's most innovative MCs. They have the ability to offer fresh perspective in a field often dominated by men, tackling issues that inform those very males and females about the world, their meninity, and themselves. However, rarely in the debate surrounding the greatest MCs in hip-hop history do women get their just due. In fact, they are left out of the discussion so regularly it seems systematic. Since the funky 4 plus 1 more Shyrock, females have been moving at a supreme level in hip-hop. As far back as 1976, the Bronx, New York-based collective was there on the front lines with the woman sharing mics with the men. Ever since, females have played a role being centerpieces of successful groups, spotlights and live show, and pressed on wax before rap sections were even established in record stores. In 1981, Shy Rock and the Funky 4 Plus One More appeared on Saturday Night Live, showing the whole world that rapping was far from gender exclusive. Throughout rap's first 10 years, a number of incredible female lyricists emerged, many of whom honed styles that their male counterparts borrowed, stole, or simply built upon. Names like Lisa Lee, Pebbly Poo, The Sequence, and Sparky D made strong advances despite never becoming household names. Still, each made important records that lit the path of rap's technical evolution in its opening decade. Yet, in this infant stage, the women are out removed from the historic discussion, much like their absence in the GOAT conversation. By the mid-1980s, all of hip-hop was fiercely competitive and really feisty. Rap itself became a conversation, with records by differing artists competing as a storyline. One artist with a lot of gumption and skills, a 14-year-old, the MC-born Lolita Shantae Gooden has supreme rhyme abilities, warranting her to take UTFO's Roxanne Roxanne hit and throw down with her namesake reply, Roxanne's Revenge. At the time, she was an adolescent female engaged in lyrical combat with a white-hot crew of men, and if you ask most hip-hop heads, she came out victorious. However, Shantae would soon find herself to be a target. Her rise would be tested by UTFO spinoff The Real Roxanne. Men pitting women against each other would prove to be a move employed in the industry through today. In selecting Adelaida Martinez, a woman who was older, sexualized, and arguably more commercially marketable than a team from the projects to become The Real Roxanne, UTFO, Full Force, and Select Records knew what they were doing. She was a very calculated foil to the brass tack Shantae who was arguably more real. But soon, Shantae and by proxy, women MCs would face bigger problems. The Roxanne Wars as they are remembered today preceded the Bridge Wars, a tense at times physical dispute over where hip hop originated. In both cases, Shantae's mentor, DJ Marley Marl helped push the button. From the same Queens Bridge houses that would produce Nas, Craig G, Cormega, and MC Shan, Roxanne was Marley Marl's breakthrough pupil. More than a dozen rap crews and artists were ultimately partaking the showdown that surrounded Marley's Juice Crew and Bronx, New York Posse, Boogie Down Productions. As the would-be classic records came out, the GOAT discussions began, simply driven off contrast. Sadly, Roxanne Shantae would be used as a scapegoat in the battle warfare. Just years after male artists and execs orchestrated Roxanne Shantae's first ambush, KRS-One exploited her gender in the ensuing attack. Roxanne Shantae is only good for steady fucking, blasted the teacher on seminal hit, The Bridge Is Over. And the very record that is often said to have settled the score, one of rap's reigning lyricists turned off his competition's microphone and made it about her body, gender, and womanhood. Nothing was the same. By 1986, rap transitioned from live show to 12-inch single to album. Women were there and ready. Salt and Pepper, a trio including a female DJ took the scene with hot, cool, and vicious. Also, from the talent hotbed of Queens, this trio would make history. With an answer record to Dougie Fresh and the Get Fresh Crews to show, Salt and Pepper had their end. Taking the ball and running with it, their December 1986 Next Plateau Records album would not only be the first female rap album to go platinum, it would also grab a Grammy nomination. Salt and Pepper Trail run DMC by mere months in accomplishing the badges of honor. However, 
Does the trio get a fifth of the attention of their Queens counterparts? Throughout the late 1980s, as rap began its so-called golden era, female MCs were again on the front lines. MC Light, Queen Latifah, and JJ Fad were right there, standing beside Audio 2, The Flavor Unit, and NWA. Not only were women rocking crowds, they were incorporating feminism, sexism, and unequal rights in society into booming hits. Hip-hop was making strides with both sexes, making great music in album form, and strong commentary along the way. But was it all good for everybody? As a new crop of talented females blossomed, the pioneering icons waited. Roxanne Shantae's 1989 debut was low on the totem pole within the Juice Crew, while the real Roxanne waited the length of a college education to get her own album out. The 1990s will maintain both the good and the bad. Latifah brought her personality to the small and large screen. Salt and Pepper made more and more hits for the masses, challenging the confines of genre and showing women could be sexy and strong. Meanwhile, from the Lady of Rage, to Heather B, to Bahamadia, to the Brat, skillful female MCs were attached to nearly every click and movement. Labels took interest and a plethora of albums came out. Little Kim, the clear-cut protege, the reigning MC, the notorious B.I.G., took women in hip-hop to new places. By the mid-1990s, Kimberly Jones appeared to be the total package in the heterosexual male eyes. She was the femme fatale who did dirt, rapped aggressively, and dressed like a sex kitten. Her solo debut hardcore reached number 11 on the charts, the highest mark for a female soloist to date at the time. The junior mafia queen bee could rap, but she could also sell records to women and men, perhaps for differing reasons. Missy, with her far out musical style and even more radical but vastly different image, also was a sales juggernaut, becoming the only female rapper to have six albums certified platinum. Yet, despite the accolades, massive followings, and undeniable influence, each MC's name is seldomly heard in the GOAT discussions. Perhaps the most glaring omission from GOAT conversation is Lauryn Hill. 15 years before Drake, it was L Boogie who could blend flows with croons and effortlessly flip it to wicked wordplay. Hill was the driving force behind not one, but two of the biggest selling albums in hip hop history. 1996's The Score has sold over 6 million copies, and her follow up solo album, The Miseducation of Lauryn Hill, topped that with over 8 million copies sold. Her critical acclaim matched, if not surpassed, her commercial success. She garnered eight Grammy Awards, including Best Album and Best New Artist. One of the biggest champions of Lauren's skills is Cool Mo D, a GOAT contender in his own right. In his famed rap report card for Ego Trip's Book of Rap List, the treacherous three alum gave Miss Hill a perfect score. If one of rap's pioneering MCs, who led packs in the 70s, 80s, and 90s, considers Hill one of the all-time great MCs, to borrow a line from Jay-Z, why isn't she on everybody's GOAT list, excluding nobody? As the world continues to debate the likelihood and feasibility of the first female president of the United States, why not a female GOAT? Whether Lauryn Hill, Missy Elliott, MC Light, Queen Latifah, or Nicki Minaj, what holds us back from crowning a female MC or even regularly putting women in the discussion? By the numbers and by critical acclaim, the hit making and the impact, the contenders are there, arguably having traveled a more difficult road. Biases affect the GOAT discussion, and the more we talk about them, the more those man-made walls are torn down. <laughs>